Okay, thank you very much. Well, I'm going to divide this talk into two parts. I'm going to start by talking about some principles from Catholic social teaching, which I think should make us question whether, in principle, we should welcome the welfare state um, in its modern form. And I then want to look at some of the urgent economic problems which have arisen as a result of the welfare state. So the first principle of Catholic social teaching, uh, I should say I'm not a uh, philosopher or a theologian, I'm an economist, so um, my exposition of this first part may not be as rigorous as, say, Father Martin's uh, exposition of a similar topic. So the first principle of, of Catholic social teaching is that of um, human dignity. And from this develops the second principle of the common good a concept which is often used to evaluate public policy. And the common good is often defined as the sum total of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfilment more fully and more easily. And sometimes ensuring human flourishing is used as a, a sort of shorthand for the common good. Now, this is definitely not a sort of utilitarian uh, calculus that should involve us pulling um, public policy levers to try to make uh, society a better place uh, in our own subjective view. That is not what the common good uh, is about. Inste instead, it uh, really involves ensuring that the basic conditions exist which can allow all persons, all human persons, to flourish and respond to God's calling. Not just uh, flourish economically, I, I should add. Um, now, at this stage, and this is why it's relevant to the welfare state, it's worth observing that without a basic level of material uh, provision for those who have nothing, uh, food, shelter, water, um, some health care and so on, then human flourishing wouldn't be possible. And it's this observation, I think, which tends to lead people to think about the welfare state as potentially being justified by Catholic social teaching. Um, now, the state, it is, it, is, it is true, must ensure that all have the basics for living, but it doesn't mean that the state should provide um, th these things. The vast majority of people, for example, obtain their food, clothing and shelter by themselves and uh, for themselves and for their family uh, from their wages, and the state doesn't provide it uh, for them. Neither should it be assumed, necessarily, that it's the role of the state to ensure that, um, that to, to provide and finance for people health and education. It may be the role of the state to ensure that all people can have access to health and education, but it doesn't follow from that at all, that it's the role of the state uh, to provide and finance health, education and other forms of welfare. Now, of course, the primary provision, uh, the, the primary vehicle for the provision of welfare is the family. And within the family, my children have a right um, according to Catholic social teaching, to basic goods such as food, shelter, water, etc., uh, with which I provide them, with, with my wife. Um, but again, the state doesn't intervene directly. It intervenes very indirectly through the no law of neglect. If I didn't um, feed my children uh, properly to such an extent that they were malnourished, then the state would intervene, take me to court, and somehow enforce um, that, that, that provision. Now, an important aspect of, of human dignity in allowing um, human flourishing is to allow people freedom in the economic and, and social sphere. We are not acting as made in God's image if we are simply told what to do, if we are simply a small cog in a large wheel of a huge uh, government administrative uh, apparatus. If we cannot choose how to develop appropriate welfare arrangements for our family and combine with others in society and the community, to obtain th these most important and intimate um, uh, forms of provision for health, education and so on, we are somehow diminished uh, as people. And again, this is quite clear in um, the Catholic Church's very uh, colourful attacks on socialism, uh, in the early social teaching documents in particular. The family comes first, uh, and the family should be uh, um, broadly free, and the state is there to serve the family and not to dominate uh, the family. Now, it's often suggested that the third principle of Catholic social teaching is the principle of solidarity. And this is very frequently used by the left uh, to justify significant intervention in the form of a welfare state. Indeed, the left often jumps straight from the principle of solidarity to justify almost anything that the state does uh, for the purposes of, say, alleviating poverty or income redistribution, 
etc. And it is very clear that the common good requires um, a spirit of solidarity and the widespread nurturing of the virtue of solidarity. And that comes from another intrinsic feature of the human condition, the fact that we are made to uh, love others and to live in community, not as isolated uh, individuals. But again, the church is very clear. If, one, if you read the um, social documents um, uh, properly and faithfully, that solidarity is not something that should be delegated to political structures. And there have been very, uh, many warnings about this in Catholic social teaching. <coughs> uh, indeed, it's worth noting that the sharing of goods that was a characteristic of the early church and is, um, uh, uh, and is uh, described quite vividly in, in the Acts of the Apostles, for example, was something that was done um, freely by the community of Christians. It was not regarded as a function of the political authorities. And when, the Catholic, um, when Catholic social teaching documents talk about solidarity, um, they are rarely, in fact, referring to action that is taken by the state. Um, as Pope Benedict XVI put it in Caritas in Veritate, solidarity is first and, foremost, first and foremost a sense of responsibility on the part of everyone with regard to everyone, and it cannot therefore be merely delegated to the state. And he then warned about too much confidence being put in the state as an organisation that could perhaps achieve what we want to achieve directly and, and quickly um, when, when we want to achieve something like the alleviation of poverty. So when the church has talked about um, solidarity and the preferential option for the poor, she's generally been referring, it, uh, referring to it in the context of charity, love and service in providing for your neighbour without expecting anything in return. So, in short, solidarity is a virtue to be practised and not a political action plan. Now, why can solidarity not be delegated to the state? Well, firstly, the state can only achieve its objectives using coercion. Um, the, the state subverts free will when it taxes one group of people in order to, um, to um, give to another group of people or tells us how we should uh, have our health care or our education uh, provided. Now, the state might be right to do that under certain circumstances, limited circumstances, um, but those circumstances should certainly be limited in scope and preferably um, temporary. And again, Catholic social teaching is very clear about that. When freedom in the economic sphere is curtailed, um, a human person's dignity um, as a person more generally is curtailed. And I think this is especially so when human persons are prevented from taking important decisions uh, with regard to how um, healthcare is provided or how they educate um, children and so on. Indeed, the church has described tr um, the importance of parental autonomy uh, in terms of um, children's education as actually being an aspect of freedom of conscience. Once a state takes control of education, it is undermining uh, freedom of conscience. So man is a thinking, acting, reasoning, human person, and if he is not allowed to think, act and reason in the economic sphere, then he is in some sense made less human. Now secondly, the state is remote from those whose needs it is trying to meet. And I'll pr um, produce a longer, uh, I'll expand this quote later, right, right at the end, but um, as Pope Benedict put it in Deus Caritas Est, the state which would provide everything, absorbing everything into itself, would ultimately become a mere bureaucracy incapable of guaranteeing the very thing which the suffering person, every person needs, namely loving personal concern. And if you talk to people who actually work with, um, with people in extreme need, people who are sleeping on the streets and so on, they will agree with that immediately. They will, they will um, appreciate that you can't actually help these people unless you know them and work with them personally. And the state, uh, through uh, providing, um, through large bureaucracies, is simply incapable of providing what uh, people who are in need uh, actually require. Um, so, and and that, that kind of hints at, at a point which I um, uh, want to expand upon, that there is a sense in which as a society becomes more socialist, it becomes less social. 
And I, I think this is a, a, an important point which we should make regularly when um, uh, talking about the welfare state. There is a sense in which the modern welfare state is extremely individualist uh, as a concept, whilst at the same time undermining um, human autonomy. It manages to do both at the same time. Essentially, the state says to us, if you can live without state help, that's fine. We'll tax you somewhat, um, but you can take care of yourself. We won't interfere. Look after yourself. If, on the other hand, you don't have enough to live on, the state simply sends you a cheque and says, provide for yourself. And all welfare, modern welfare states in Western economies are designed to provide people, this was the, um, uh, the, the basis really of that last question to Steve in the last session, all modern welfare states are designed to um, provide people with sufficient income that they can actually uh, have enough to live on without actually relying on family, extended family, others in the community, fraternal groups, and so on. So, um, in a sense, the welfare state promotes atomization and reduces uh, socialization uh, in the name of uh, socialism. <coughs> now, there's a lot of, in Catholic social teaching uh, on these kinds of issues, and it is very dangerous, as uh, Father Martin uh, was saying last night, to sort of take isolated comments from the social teaching um, of the church and try to um, justify particular economic theories using those isolated comments. The left are very good at doing that uh, and, and we sh uh, shouldn't do the same. So I, I want to achieve a slightly more um, limited objective which is to suggest that if you go through the teaching documents of the church you should at least end up rather sceptical of the welfare state. Shouldn't turn you into a a Miesian or a rabid libertarian free market economist, but at least it should make you somewhat sceptical uh, um, uh, to uh, the welfare state as a solution to um, uh, um, uh, problems of poverty and so on. So here are some of the... Um, which button is it to move on? Okay, which button? Just that one, okay. So in Centesimus Annus, which was um, uh, um, published to uh, uh, celebrate the 100th anniversary of Rerum Novarum, it was said, in recent years, the range of such intervention uh, has vastly expanded to the point of creating a new type of state, the so-called welfare state. Excesses and abuses, especially in recent years, have provoked very, very harsh criticisms of the welfare state, dubbed the social assistance state. Malfunctions and defects in the social assistance state are the result of an inadequate um, understanding of the tasks proper to the state. By intervening directly and depriving society of its responsibility, the social assistance state leads to a loss of human energies and an inordinate increase in public agencies which are dominated by bureaucratic ways of thinking and accompanied by an enormous increase in spending. And that is both, I, I think, quite prophetic uh, but also I important for this distinction it means between, uh, th that it makes between society and the state, the state taking over the functions uh, of society being the intrinsic um, problem. Um, now, quadragesimo anno, which was referred to quite a bit last night, um, I, th this, uh, it's, it certainly is dangerous to sort of take little bits out of, uh, out of that particular document, but this, this is quite interesting uh, because of the way it's, and there are other statements in Quadragesimo Anno which uh, are also supportive of, of this line, um, because of the way it raises charity to the um, uh, important uh, virtue which we should practice to assist the poor. The question arises, or rather is raised without warrant by some, whether the principles of Christian truth cannot perhaps be modified to some degree and be tempered so as to meet socialism halfway, as it were, by a middle course and come to an agreement with it. A vain hope, those who want to be apostles among socialists ought to profess Christian truth whole and entire, openly and sincerely, and not con connive in, um, at error in any way. If they truly wish to be heralds of the gospel, let them above all strive to show to socialists that socialist claims, so far as they are just, are far more, far more strongly supported by the pr principles of Christian faith 
and, this is the key sentence which I want to highlight, are much more effectively promoted through the power of Christian charity. Um, Rerum Navarum warned about the um, uh, excessive uh, t taxation and the importance of allowing the wage earner to keep his wages so he could make provision for himself and his family and also make um, provision for the future and, if, um, and, and um, for when the family fell on hard times. And Caritas in Veritate, I'll come back and mention Caritas in Veritate um, a bit later because it was a very strange document the way it all fitted together. Um, but in the sort of better third of that uh, document, uh, it uh, talks about how alongside profit-oriented private enterprise and the various types of public enterprise, there must be room for commercial entities based on mutualist principles and pursuing social ends to take root and express themselves. And they're very similar. That, that's a, um, an echo, really, of the sorts of things which um, uh, Steve Davis was talking about that were so common in providing welfare in 19th century Britain and also in continental uh, Europe. Now, Rerum Navarum, um, in this paragraph, actually sort of suggests what the state should be doing and what its limits should be in this field of providing for the poor. The contention then that the civil government should, at its option, intrude into and exercise intimate control over the family and the household is a great pernicious and pernicious error. True, if a family finds itself in exceeding dis distress, utterly deprived of the counsel of friends, and without any prospect of extricating itself, it is right that extreme necessity be met by public aid, since each family is part of the Commonwealth. This doesn't, to me, look like a statement which is suggesting that the, uh, the government should be spending about 50% of national income, with the vast majority of that being on welfare provision. Um, it looks like a, a statement suggesting that the state should be the last resort, providing for those who cannot provide for themselves those goods which are necessary for human dignity. And this is Rerum Navarum again, and um, th this, this is also reflecting on the sorts of institutions which um, Steve talked about in his talk this morning. And there are not wanting Catholics blessed with affluence who have, as it were, cast in their lot with the wage earners, and who have spent large sums in founding and widely spreading benefit and insurance societies, by means of which the working man may without difficulty acquire through his labour not only many present advantages, but also the certainty of honourable support in days to come. The state should watch over these societies, but it should not thrust itself into their peculiar concerns and their organisation, for things move and live by the spirit inspiring them, and may be killed by the rough grasp of a hand uh, from without. So I should be talking in the, in the second part of the talk um, about the size of the welfare state, how it's expanded and the damage that's done. But it, it certainly does appear from these um, quotations that um, Catholic social teaching may well support a role for the state, and there's a lot to be debated. Catholic social teaching is not um, uh, like the, the theological and moral teaching of the church. It, it's provisional and... Um, uh, um, not binding like the theological and moral teaching of the church, it is open to debate. But there is a lot, a lot in the tenor of Catholic social teaching which is supporting the general line that the state should not be the prime uh, provider of welfare, that should be for the family and other institutions of society, and the state should be the last resort. So, if that's what Catholic social teaching says, what is the reality um, today in terms of the size of, of the state? Well, it's interesting to go back to the late 19th century when Rerum Navarum uh, was, was written. And at that time, most um, um, governments in Europe would spend about 10% of national income. And it's also interesting to note what that would have been spent on. So if you take um, the British government, which from 1870 to about 1900 spent about 10% of national income, about half of that was spent on um, defence and the other half was spent on debt interest. That debt had been piled up over the previous centuries as a result of fighting wars, basically. So the function of the state, as far as its financing was concerned, was essentially to finance uh, current wars and current defence and to finance past wars through the servicing of debt. And it performed virtually no other functions at all. There were local government that for performed a few functions, such as providing sewers and public health, um, but at a relatively modest cost. Uh, 
Um, and then since then, the proportion of national income spent by the state has just grown at an extraordinary rate. It took off particularly after the First World War and then again after the Second World War, but then in some countries, including the UK, there was then an explosion in the uh, early 21st century as well. And we've reached a point really where, where in most, the vast majority of European Union countries, the state is spending either just below or just above 50% of national income. And in most cases, somewhat over half of that and a growing proportion is on welfare, widely defined. So that's, that would be welfare, that would be health, um, pensions and income transfers to working age people. So that would exclude education. Um, now, if you read Caritas in Veritate, the first part of that document um, talks about how welfare has been pared back and cut to the bone as a result of liberalist tendencies in the um, last 10 or tw uh, in the previous 10 or 20 years. Well, this is a picture in uh, one of those liberalist countries, the United Kingdom. Um, this is what happened to government spending on um, welfare. So the, the dark blue line here is health. The green line is pensions, red line is education, and the lighter blue line is welfare to people of, of working age. Now, ag ignore the graph after this point because uh, the, they are projections uh, and the government was trying to constrain spending uh, after um, 2010. But there's, been a, there's a huge um, increase in education spending. Uh, this is in real terms as well, after, after inflation. So healthcare spending rises by nearly 50% in just 10 years. Um, uh, um, sorry, um, health, healthcare spending rises by 100% in real terms in, in 10 years. Um, pensions rise by about 30%. Welfare to working, uh, working age people rises by about 30%. And this is in a period when employment was also expanding rapidly. It's, this is not a period of high unemployment. So what Caritas and Veritate describe as the liberalist tendencies leading to a, um, a pairing back to the bone of welfare provision um, in um, Western societies is really quite the opposite of the, um, uh, no, em the empirical facts of the matter. Welfare expanded very rapidly in a number of countries in the early 21st century. And the same has happened um, in the United States under George Bush II, followed by Obama, where there's been a most rapid um, increase in federal government spending in that country's um, history. <clears throat> now, given that the church is 2,000 years old, and, um, uh, it, no, and, and, and until 1890, um, the, the, uh, rather until um, really after the First World War, governments had no real role in welfare provision very much at all. The idea that there is some kind of objective theological position in favour of a welfare state is, is really rather an odd one because um, the, the welfare state has really only existed at all for sort of 5% of, uh, of, of Christendom. Now, um, just a moment. So, what are the effects of the welfare state? Well, different welfare states are designed in different ways. And you tend to find that the Anglo-Saxon welfare states, um, those in the United Kingdom and the United States, are especially anti-family. And the continental welfare states, perhaps being influenced by Catholic social teaching to a greater degree, are slightly less anti-family, but are very anti-work. And um, that's, um, I, th I think, um, illustrated by the next uh, couple of slides. So this is... Um, uh, just one example, but you could replicate this, ex this example in um, uh, Italy, Spain, many, many other uh, countries. If you, um, if you employ somebody in France, you're an employer and you choose to uh, employ somebody um, in France at the minimum wage, you would have to pay them nine euros uh, 43. The minimum wage is similar in Fl France to the level in the UK. As an employer, you then have to pay social insurance tax of four euros, four cents. And the employee, this poor employee who is only earning the minimum wage, also pays an social insurance tax of two euros, four cents. Um, in the UK, the same employee would actually pay no tax and the, or very little tax and the employer would pay very little tax as, as well. So, what you find is that the take-home pay of this 
person being employed at the lowest possible level of uh, salary would be less in France than it would be in the UK, but the employer has to pay more than twice as much to employ that person. And you know, this, as I shall show in a moment, the results of this are very clear um, in employment and unemployment uh, statistics throughout the European Union. So most welfare states in most continental European Union countries are very anti-work and they penalise um, the young, the poor, those who are least productive um, the, the, the most. <coughs> the UK welfare state is, is especially um, anti-family and this is also true um, in the United States. Um, and, and in particular, um, the U UK welfare state makes it very difficult for relatively low-earning, single-earner families with children. So a mother and a father living under the same roof um, will tend to pay a relatively high level of taxes, um, but also um, get a very low level of welfare benefits. And um, if that mother and father split up, or as is more likely, they never uh, join together, um, then what tends to happen is that the mother then receives a very high level of welfare benefits and the father would pay, if the father was working, the father would pay the same level of taxes. And so there's really very strong disincentives towards family formation amongst the low paid. And again, you see that in the, um, you see that in the uh, statistics. So 20% of UK children grow up in a household where no adult works. Um, that they're mostly single parent adults. 30% of UK children grow up in a household where no adult works full time. Now that's an extraordinary statistic because um, um, unemployment in the UK is quite low. It's only about 7% compared to much lower than most continental European uh, countries. But to have 30% of children growing up in, an ad in a, fa in a um, household where no adult works full time is quite extraordinary. And the reason for that is because if the father is, a low earning, um, is, is earning a relatively small amount of money and he forms a household with the mother, so they form a family, um, then the mother will lose all entitlements to benefits and the father will carry on paying taxes. If, on the other hand, the mother and father never get together, they, all, they, they just live apart, the, the father will pay the same level of taxes and the mother will receive a very large sum in benefits. And if you, if you do the sums, you're talking about potentially tens of thousands of pounds a, um, a low-earning couple can, can uh, make by not actually getting married, forming a family, or even, for that matter, living together in a stable relationship and forming a family in the same household. 40% of children in uh, low-income households are in lone parent households. And now in the UK, uh, um, nearly half of children are born to unmarried parents. And again, the, the, the reason for that is because very wealthy people can afford to have children. Um, people who have no earnings at all can also afford to have children because the benefit system um, uh, provides for those children. People who are earning modest amounts of income, if they have more children, then they effectively have to pay for those children themselves. They don't get uh, any greater benefits. And, the, and so family size amongst that group is, um, has, has shrunk dramatically, whilst family size amongst um, um, those who are not in work and those who are very rich uh, has not done so. And amazingly, in Britain, households with no adult in work have a higher average number of children than households that have a working adult in them. So if you think about what you want to do in order to provide for your children, um, you'd think, well, let's get married, form a stable relationship, let's have one of us working so there's an income coming into the, hou uh, in, into the household, uh, and so on. Well, the benefit system uh, the, and the tax system, the welfare state in the UK has produced precisely the opposite result. Uh, that is that um, uh, people choose to have more children um, when there is uh, only one adult in the house and there is nobody working. These are not the conditions which are uh, necessary or, or um, uh, appropriate for um, human, um, human flourishing. Now, this, this is um, slightly peripheral but, but, uh, to, to perhaps a discussion that we're going to have, but, but it, it's not unimportant. As you go up the income scale, if you are um, a, a family with, say, three children, in order to finance the welfare state, you, get, um, you obviously have to pay taxes. Um, and if the government is spending 50% of national income, 
then ultimately taxes are going to have to be 50% of national income. Governments can borrow for a while, but eventually um, taxes have to catch up with spending, or spending has to be reined in. Um, also, if you are targeting benefits at poor people, as people get better off, um, of course the state withdraws those benefits from you. So if you, th if you think about somebody who starts on a relatively low level of income, let's say you know, that around about £10,000 a year or something, once you start earning above that level, the state, not unreasonably, starts clawing away the benefits from you because you don't, it's felt you don't need them anymore, and of course starts charging you taxes in order to finance everything it provides. Almost everybody in Britain, um, if, if, almost all households with two adults and three children in who are earning in this bracket here roughly £10,000 to roughly £40,000, um, if you add up the taxes they pay and the benefits that get withdrawn from them, they are losing 73 pence in every extra pound um, that they earn. And you know, the long-term effect of, uh, of that on incentives, um, incentives to improve yourself, to do overtime, to get uh, better training and so on, uh, I suspect are uh, substantial, although there's very little empirical work uh, on that. Uh, I might add that almost all households with uh, two adults and three children are in this income band here. So almost everybody is affected by that. Now, what are the results of, of, of all this? Well, the kind of unemployment levels which um, the post-war architects of the welfare state could, uh, would never have envisaged. So if you look at youth unemployment in um, continental Europe, and for that matter in, in Anglo-Saxon countries, you're talking about levels which start at 20% and go up to over 50% in, in, in Spain. Um, the reason for that is because if you have high costs of employment and high taxation, then those who are most effective are the least productive um, uh, in society, those who's, um, uh, who can command the lowest wage, which is generally young people. You, you can add to that problem as well in um, France, Italy and Spain, the regulations which make it very difficult to, um, to make people redundant once they've been taken on, so it makes employers very uh, nervous about hiring um, young people. But even if you look at unemployment in prime working age, Again, this is at levels which um, nobody could have been... These, these levels may seem quite, quite low because we're used to such high levels of youth unemployment, but these are levels which could never have been envisaged um, by architects of the welfare state. Um, in, the, in the early post-war period, taking out the Great Depression for most of the interwar period, nearly all adults of prime working age were um, uh, in full-time work. Now, I should say that although the, the age group here is 25 to 74, um, it excludes, it excludes um, uh, older people who, who have retired and are receiving a pension. So, the, so this is unemployment as a percentage of those who are in the labour market and looking for work. And no, the idea that one-fifth of the total workforce should be out of work, this is not just caused by the welfare state and high taxation in, in, in Spain, other things as well. Um, is, is, is quite, um, quite extraordinary. But the, the norm in continental Europe essentially is these levels here, 10 or 11%. <coughs> now, one of the problems of... Uh, what, one of the most expensive aspects of the welfare state, which I'll talk about um, in more detail a bit later, um, is uh, the provision of retirement um, pensions. And... One of the difficulties of retirement pensions is their increasing cost as a society starts to age. Uh, I'll discuss that uh, later. But the other uh, aspect is that generous retirement pensions, and especially generous, pen especially generous pensions which are provided to people for early retirement, as happens in Italy, Spain, um, and a number of other continental European Union countries, leads to low activity rates, in other words, low levels of employment, um, amongst people who are still really in prime working age, 50 or above. And there's a sense in which the welfare state begins to kind of um, uh, devour itself. You get a, 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 a vicious circle because the provision of retirement benefits requires higher taxes. Those retirement benefits um, then lead people to retire early. When people retire early, the tax base falls. The government gets less tax income, so it has to raise taxes for everybody else and, and, and so on. So if you look at this age group here, age 55 to 64, um, 
in, in Italy, well over half of that age group don't work. Uh, in the UK, the figure is somewhat better. Around 80% of people who are aged 60 to 64 in Italy don't work. So what really we're expected to do in a modern welfare state is be educated until we're about 21, get a job if we're lucky by the time we're 25, work for 30 years, and then live on a retirement pension for maybe 40 years. In other words, out of a whole, the, the, the whole of an average lifespan of 90 years, perhaps work for about a third of it, whilst the rest of that time one is living on an income provided by somebody else. And no, a society simply cannot support itself on that basis. Now, another side effect of the welfare state is a shadow economy. And the um, uh, Austrian economist, by which I don't mean Austrian school, but Austrian, um, Austrian from Linz um, University, Friedrich Schneider has done a lot of work on the estimation of the shadow economy. It's very difficult to estimate the size of the shadow economy because, by its, um, because the shadow economy is made up of activity which is not reported to the authorities. So uh, th there's no official statistics on the size of the shadow economy. But um, Schneider uh, reckons that the shadow economy is somewhere around 10% of national income in most Anglo-Saxon countries, rather better in Switzerland, around 15% of the of, uh, national income in um, high-tax Northern European Union countries and about a quarter of national income in um, Greece, um, Italy, Spain, which isn't on this slide, and, and Portugal. France is a very strange outlier. It seems to have a very low shadow economy whilst having very high tax rates and also um, sort of is semi-Mediterranean uh, as, as well. Now, what are the causes of the shadow economy? Well, again, Snyder's done some work on this, and he reckons that the level of taxes and social security contributions explains about 40% of the size of the shadow economy. A further 20 to 25% is explained by this thing here called tax morale. And that essentially means how fair do people think the whole system of taxation is. If I think my neighbour is cheating the system, I'm more likely to, to um, cheat the system, so tax morale falls. If I think the government's corrupt and not using my money properly, I'm more likely to work in the shadow economy and feel less of a moral obligation to pay tax. That's what tax morale is all about. So again, there's a real danger here of getting a vicious circle. Tax rates go up, so the shadow economy rises. Because the shadow economy rises, less income is declared to the authorities, and um, uh, tax revenue falls. So the government pushes up tax rates further, and people see that other people are cheating, so again, the shadow economy rises and, um, uh, the sh uh, and um, tax revenue falls and tax rates have to go up and that causes a rise in the shadow economy and, and, and so on. Now, I'll, I'll uh, come back to the morality of these issues right at the end when I wind up in a few moments. <clears throat> but uh, finally, I just want to talk about debt. Now, you would think that... Um, if, if you, if you uh, look at the news headlines and the economic analysis of the Eurozone, that the Eurozone is pretty... Um, Euro, a lot of Eurozone countries are pretty indebted, and, and that's true. And... Um, gov but governments outside continental Europe as well have, have reached a similar uh, kind of situation, and it's been going on for a long time. So if you go back to the mid-90s, when the economy was doing really rather well, government borrowing in these four selected countries, which are reasonably typical, was very high as a proportion of national income. Go forward to 2012, the situation got somewhat worse, albeit in the wake of the financial crisis. <coughs> um, if you look at the accumulated debt of um, the same four countries, well, that's pretty grim back in 1995. Italy, funnily enough, had actually managed to control the situation uh, and... Um, and, and, and debt had actually uh, 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 fallen, but in other countries, perhaps most notably Japan, uh, debt had, um, had, had, had risen and risen very rapidly. Now, Steve will tell you, we sometimes have a debate about this issue, that these figures for uh, national debt are not especially high uh, historically. 
after the Napoleonic Wars, um, Britain had a much higher national debt than um, this figure here. I think, what was the peak, Steve? 240%? 250% of national income. And, and we dealt with the problem. But we dealt with the problem um, for two reasons. One is that we had a relatively, high le a relatively low level of government spending and taxation in the first place. It wasn't difficult to manage and balance the budget and repay debt when you're starting from this position. Much difficult to repay um, national debt when you're starting from a position of taxing your population 50% of national income. But also, um, debt was accumulated in the 18th and 19th centuries to deal with extreme events, occasionally famine and bad harvest, but more normally, war. And it's not unreasonable that if you fight a war, you fight that for the benefit of future generations, or at least we do in England, not, quite, not necessarily the case in Germany, but uh, it's just fought for purely um, uh, militaristic uh, purposes of, uh, of, of national expansion. Sorry, that's uh, meant to be humorous, not uh, uh, criticism, of Ger criticism of Germany. Um, anyway, we, we, we fight wars for, to protect and defend future generations, and not unreasonable to amortize the cost of those wars over future generations. But what's happened since the Second World War is that we've, been, we, we've got structural deficit in peacetime, which are um, um, simply being used to finance current consumption. In other words, it's like um, somebody in the middle of his working life, aged 30 or 40, um, spending £1,000 more than he earns each year and putting it on his credit card, with, uh, on his credit card, with no real ability or intention of ever being able to reduce the debt. That's what governments have been like in recent years. But that's um, not the half of it, really. We've set up social security systems, which have led to the growth of what the economists call implicit um, government debt. And about six-sevenths of all government debt is, is off balance sheet. And what has happened is that um, in the post-war period, we've set up these social security systems, which essentially involve a working generation. So think, about, think of these guys as being the workers, and these guys beneath being the children. So this working generation goes to the ballot box and promises itself pensions in... Um, in, in um, future years, when, when they retire, as, as we've seen from rel relatively early ages. And also, and this is important too, especially in Britain where there's almost no private financing of healthcare, also promises itself um, um, healthcare benefits. The vast majority of healthcare is um, um, paid for towards the end of somebody's working life. Now, in the past, when if people wanted to make commitments for the future, if people wanted to retire or um, they, they wanted health care, they actually put the, money themside, uh, put the money aside themselves and saved through friendly societies, which Steve described this morning, or mutual insurance societies or other forms of insurance um, um, uh, fund. What we did in the post-war period is that this generation said, OK, when we retire, the children will come along and replace us, and instead of us making a sacrifice today, putting money aside for our future pensions, the children will come along and they'll pay taxes, and those taxes will be used to pay for our health care and, and our pensions instead. So in other words, the working generation got away with promising themselves benefits without making any commitments themselves, which I think is a fairly, you know, that's the basis of the welfare state, it's a pretty immoral basis to promise yourself something without actually making a sacrifice yourself and in imposing that sacrifice upon your children. And of course what happened is that this working generation um, is living much longer and it's having far fewer children than previous generations and, and so um, these welfare benefits are becoming unaffordable because the tax base is shrinking and the, um, uh, and the um, older population is rising in size. And if you actually look at the uh, economists have tried to compute what th this implicit debt, in other words, the total value of all these um, pensions, uh, this healthcare provision and so on, that the working generation has promised itself without putting any money aside. And these are the kind of figures you come up with. Um, 
If you're Swiss, you're okay because you have lots of funded health and pension provision. But if you're almost anywhere else in the world apart from Chile, um, Australia, and Estonia, um, then the total um, value of these, what are known as implicit pay-as-you-go social security debts, uh, is enormous. And it's not clear how we're going to deal with, with, with these. <coughs> a smaller and smaller tax base paying larger and larger benefits to a group of people who are living longer and longer. And um, economists have um, actually computed, uh, and it's very, very difficult even to forecast what's going to happen to the economy over the next six months, never mind uh, try to do simulations over the next 60 years. But anyway, the eco economists have looked at what might happen, uh, or what needs to happen rather, for countries to balance their books, in other, wor in other words, to end up debt-free over the next 60 years if they are to meet all the health and pensions commitments that the working generation has made to itself. And those figures are quite alarming. And I've just picked four countries out, which are pretty typical. Uh, UK, Germany, France, and Spain. And the figures suggest that, uh, um, let's take Germany as we're fairly close to Germany, uh, as an example, that in order to um, provide all the health and pensions commitments that have been uh, made um, to, and to end up debt-free in 60 years' time, in Germany there'll have to be an immediate increase in taxes of 15% of national income for the next 60 years. So not just for the next five years, but for the next 60 years. An immediate and forever increase in taxes in a 15, a 14% of, of national income. Of course, that's impossible to achieve. If you raise taxes by that much, economic growth would fall to such an extent that it would be entirely counterproductive. So what do you have to do on the spending side? Well, these figures are quite salutary. Um, the, uh, you'd have to cut all health and social uh, spending. So that means health, um, pensions, and welfare to people of working age. doesn't include education. By 50%. Now and forever in order to balance the books. In other words, not actually meet these commitments the working generation has uh, uh, um, promised itself. So in two senses, really, this whole welfare state is based on a fraud. That, um, you, you've got um, a generation promising itself things without actually making any sacrifice or commitment itself, but relying on what are increasingly becoming non-existent children to pay taxes to finance those benefits. And secondly, a working generation which is promising things to itself when large numbers of members of that generation will, as Steve said this morning, um, be expecting things which can't possibly be afforded. And as a result of the fact that they're expecting things, they won't have made, actually, they won't have made any independent provision uh, for themselves. And if we are being... If, if the welfare state leads to that level of dishonesty, I, I think Catholics ought to be querying its um, uh, provenance and uh, morality. <coughs> So, um, uh, the prognosis is, is, is grim, that's the bad news. Um, the good news is that I think if you interpret Catholic social teaching faithfully, uh, then you, um, you don't really get any strong justification for a welfare state uh, at all. And I think um, it's your role, it's my role, and, and be your role, I think, in the future to make that argument to try to change the climate of opinion so that we can have a policy that's based on better economic and better moral uh, foundations. A welfare society, as, a, as opposed to a welfare state, involves, I think, a genuinely free economy with family, charitable organisations, uh, commercial institutions, uh, trade unions as well, and mutual societies all playing their part. Um, and I think embedded within such institutions um, is a much deeper sense of community, solidarity, and, um, and uh, uh, and personal help than is possible through welfare state bureaucracies. The welfare state is degrading the family, undermining work, encouraging the shadow economy, undermining self-reliance, and making people dependent on the efforts of others rather than um, on their own industriousness. In other words, it subsidises selfishness. Now, you might argue that we shouldn't in this way sort of connect economic and moral issues that people should do the right thing, regardless of the incentives they face. 
So people should have lots of children um, to provide for them in old age, even if we have a state pension system that's going to provide for them in old age. People shouldn't um, um, uh, cheat the government and not declare their income, even if the financial costs of them doing so are high. People should not retire, even if they are paid to retire by the government. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. People should not retire, even if they are paid to retire by the government. They should carry on working and paying taxes. People should not be unemployed, and, uh, even if they're better off on benefits. And when it comes to the UK and the US, and no doubt some other countries, people should get married, even if it's financially um, uh, penalises them to do so. Uh, all these things are true, but at the same time, it's not a Catholic interpretation of the state and of law that we should actually design laws which makes it difficult for people to choose the right thing. We, indeed, the uh, framework of law should be designed so it's easier rather than more difficult uh, to choose what is right. Now, um, just finally to um, uh, expand that uh, quotation of Pope Benedict's um, that I started with, or that I uh, brought out near the beginning. Well, do it in less than three minutes. <coughs> I, I think this is something which is extremely perceptive. And when, when Pope Benedict was writing um, off his own bat and um, rather than having things written for him, almost everything he said about economic matters actually, and for that matter almost anything else, I think really did get to the heart uh, of, of the issue. So Pope Benedict in Deus Caritas Est said, there is no ordering of the state that is so just that it can eliminate the need for the service of love. Whoever wants to eliminate love is preparing to eliminate man as such. There will always be suffering which cries out for, for consolation and help. There will always be loneliness. There will always be situations of material need where help in the form of concrete love of neighbour is indispensable. Um, we do not need a state which regulates and controls everything, but a state which, in accordance with the principle of subsidiarity, generously acknowledges and supports initiatives arising from the different social forces and combines spontaneity with closeness to those in need. I think anybody who reads Catholic social teaching and comes to the conclusion that um, despite the fact the government in nearly every European country now spends around 50% of national income, that it's the Catholic approach to resolve all the re remaining problems of poverty, um, uh, lack of provision of healthcare, education and so on, by expanding that proportion yet further, um, is actually misinterpreting Catholic social teaching and leading us down a path which essentially is a path to um, national bankruptcy.